to begin by inviting Professor John Clarkson, who leads the Engineering Design Center in the Department of Engineering, to talk to us about engineering safe systems. I feel as if I've come a bit from left field to be here today, but I hope by the end of 10 minutes you'll see some sense in why an engineer is kicking off this event. So I thought I should explain my interest, what am I here for? I run a group of about 60 to 70 researchers, and we study high-tech companies and institutions, mainly to try and improve their processes. So all the companies represented here are world-class in what they do, but we're trying to help them make their processes better. And about a decade ago, we were asked by the Department of Health and the Design Council with collaborators from the Royal College of Art and the University of Surrey to put together a report on design for patient safety. It's this thing called the blood bag report. I will pass that round. It, it almost came out as a sticking plaster, but they thought at the last minute that probably wasn't a good message about healthcare. So it came out as a blood bag instead. And I'll pass that around you and have a look at it. And I'll come back to what we said in that report later. But first of all, a story. The patient leaves the safety of their home to enter the healthcare system. They go to the GP to seek help for ongoing pain from arthritis, and they're referred to the local hospital. They go to the outpatient clinic, and they're assessed and started on weekly doses of methotrexate. They go back home, and they're expected to manage their weekly medication regime. In this case, it was methotrexate weekly and folic acid daily. Nothing unusual. This is what you'd expect for arthritis. Their blood was monitored. Methotrexate is very toxic, so you monitor the patient's blood so you can control the dose in a more dynamic way to suit the patient. So at that point, the engineer in me wants to ask one simple question. What could possibly go wrong? Now, if we go back, and it is just over a decade, the next part of the story is based on a local case. So a locum, a temporary GP, replacement GP, prescribes methotrexate daily. The error is not corrected despite routine practice checks. The pharmacist dispenses a daily dose of methotrexate. The patient, who for about two decades was on a weekly dose of methotrexate, simply thought the doctor had changed the prescription, believed the doctor, and started to take the methotrexate daily. The patient was admitted to the ear, nose, and throat ward at the local hospital with symptoms of a severe sore throat. Two blood tests failed to show the problem. They were messed up. The third time round, they finally suspected a methotrexate overdose. The patient dies. It's a horrendous death with methotrexate poisoning, not just for the patient, but all those family and carers around them. And this is one of at least 25 cases in the last 20 years or so in the UK. And that was the backdrop to us looking at safety in healthcare in the UK. The data that came to us before we did the, the work was that it was estimated that there were 850,000 medical errors occurring every year in the UK. That equates to one in 10% of hospital admissions and costs around about two billion a year in additional hospital stays alone. And the question was quite a simple one. People felt that around about 50% of these could be preventable. And the question was, well, by design. So we studied the situation, we talked to carers, clinicians, service providers, and people from other industries. And what we said at the time was that the NHS is seriously out of step with modern thinking and practice with regard to design. A direct consequence of this has been a significant incidence of avoidable risk and error. We also said there was little evidence of any understanding or practice within the NHS equivalent to those which are commonplace in other safety critical industries. In fact, the NHS didn't even see itself at that time as a safety critical industry. So in the intervening years, some things have changed. We see a few islands of excellence emerging, but the story remains predominantly the same. 
If we look to the aerospace sector, that's the Boeing 777. At the peak of its development, it employed nearly 17,000 designers. Now, that in itself is a scary statistic, getting 17,000 engineers to work together. Nearly 1,000 aircraft have been delivered since 1995. There are 3 million parts from 500 suppliers in each aircraft. Collectively, the fleet has flown nearly 25 billion nautical miles, carrying one and a quarter billion people. There have been seven incidents with no fatalities, including the aircraft that came down early at Heathrow. That's the only aircraft that's been written off in that time. This is not a one-off. This is what aerospace does for a living. I have huge complexity, and that's what they do for a living. So for me as an engineer, that inspires me to think, well, what might we learn from other engineering sectors that could be applied in healthcare? And the response we had in the report was that good design relies on a user-focused systems design approach. That is what is required in healthcare. And Lucian Leap from Harvard says something I think very interesting. He said, human beings make mistakes because the systems, tasks, and processes they work in are poorly designed. Now, of course, there are other factors that lead to error, but that, I think, from my point of view as an engineering designer, was critical. We can, we can design better and safer systems. So what level of safety is required? And this chart maps vertically frequency of occurrence from daily, weekly, monthly, annually, less frequent, and across the top severity a typical risk chart, so death on the left, severe injury, injury, and minor injury over on the right. And depending whether you're US Air Force, where injury is commonplace, or whether you're healthcare, you put the boundaries in different places as to what is acceptable. But the engineering question is, how many people can we kill? That's the starting point for safety. But 20 years ago, I was tasked with developing the control system for a fire training system for the Royal Navy. That's their old system down in Portsmouth. Dirty, smoky, difficult to repeat the training sessions. That's what we replaced it with, a prototype, to see whether you could have computer-controlled flames, smoke, heat in a closed environment. I was told you are permitted to kill one training officer every 10 years. That equipment was going to last 10 years as a prototype to provide the requirements for its successor. I often had coffee down on site, and I would always count around the room. On average, there were 10 officers in the room, and I was perfectly within my rights to kill one of them. <laughs> that focuses your mind. These are some of the guys I worked with. The project was driven by active risk assessment, both on safety terms but also on delivery. Could I deliver the project on time? I, the project manager, was the person going to go into the unit on my own with only a walkie-talkie for protection as we tested it. It's about a quarter the size of this room with six megawatts of heat output in that confined space. That focuses your mind when you start the design process. It's now in service in three locations nationally, the odds have changed. We're only now allowed to permit, or permitted to kill one trainee every 100 years. That prototype served a purpose. We now, now know how to make it safer. And I didn't kill anybody. We got there because prospective analysis, thinking about things before they happen, allowed us to identify the vast majority of the risks in that complex and dangerous system. So we didn't kill anybody. We didn't even harm anybody in 10 years of use. Unfortunately, in healthcare, most analysis is retrospective. When something happens, we want to know why, what it was that caused the event. Now, that is essential, but it is not the best way to prevent fires. So one of the big challenges I and my team have in our research is to see how do we take that engineering thinking and bring it across potentially into healthcare. And there's a gulf of understanding. There's a gulf of ways of practice. But I think there's huge potential for us to learn how we might do that. So what we want to do is to bring together the medical way of thinking, first do no harm, 
particularly to the individual. It's a way of thinking about individuals in your care with the engineering way of thinking about populations. How many people can we kill? And when I stand up in front of medics and say, well, how many people are you allowed to kill? They're not quite sure what to make of that. But it is a question we have to learn to be able to ask in some way that has relevance in healthcare. If we're going to bring these two areas of thinking together, which I think we can do very powerfully to improve safety in healthcare. So engineers ask lots of questions. What can go wrong? How likely is it to go wrong? How bad if it does go wrong? Should I do anything about it? Which is always a good question, because maybe you shouldn't. And what should I do about it? Now, just in case there's a few of you still don't quite understand what an engineer is, I'm going to end up with my favorite character, Dilbert. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh. The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> no! There, there. I think the best thing about that as an engineer is you, you, at that point, understand how your parents feel about where you ended up. <coughs> That's all I have to say. Any questions?